I'm fortunate to be sitting here with Dr. Dan Andre. Dan is the patron of Brain Injury Canada. Uh, he's also a distinguished professor at the University of Guelph Humber and the University of Waterloo. He holds a doctorate in education and a specialization in neuroscience through non-formal education. He was also a leader in the nonprofit and community sector, acting as the executive director of the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, leading them through a period of sustainability and growth. Uh, he was also the longest serving president of the Ontario Association of Social Workers and has won many, many awards, including the Caring Canada Award from the Governor General of Canada. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. And what drives this passion to give back to, to the community and, and education? Oh, well, thank you, Michelle. It's wonderful to be here with you today. And uh, for me, education is so fundamental. It's the bedrock upon which we engage in learning. And that's every day of our lives, throughout our entire lives. And uh, it also provides a bridge for us across from ourselves to the outer world and to understand people better, ideas, knowledge and that can lead to change, social change, greater awareness, and I know that, that June is Brain Injury Canada Awareness Month. Uh, so can you tell us about this? Sure. Uh, June is Brain Injury Awareness Month across Canada, and brain, awareness around brain injury has many different facets. So it's awareness about what are the types of a brain injury, what are the types of you know, traumatic and non-traumatic injury, uh, What's the impact on the individual, their family, yeah. uh, their social networks? Uh, what are the barriers they face in, in, in their community? Uh, what are the accessibility, are, are, are their communities accessible and inclusive in uh -huh. creating awareness to those policy makers um, and, and planners to make sure that their world is, is inclusive? But also awareness around how can we do better? How can we work with these individuals? And awareness about how important these individuals and families are to our communities and how important it is that we should make them feel valued, supported, and engaged. Right, exactly. So reaching out to people and, and how has awareness grown, would you say, in the last a little while or a few years, let's say? Well, I think awareness, there's been a bigger movement every June, but awareness shouldn't only happen in one month of the year. Um, so there's, you know, there's been awareness in the concussion realm with you know sports injuries, um, but then research also furthers uh, for there's awareness, but then there's also been the motivation and the grassroots of organizations, community and provincial organizations, um, and the individuals that they work with to have a louder voice, to make sure that awareness about brain injury happens all year round and yes. not just in June. Right, exactly. And so there are events all throughout the year across Canada, which you're involved in too as well, to raise that awareness and, and keep the fire going, so to speak. Absolutely, yes. Awareness is key um, to, to putting, you know, ensuring that brain injury is in the forefront and that those needs and the, the needs of the families and individuals are um, considered and, and supported. Absolutely. And so education, as we know, is, is absolutely key. We've talked about that. In terms of methods of reaching people through education, um, what, what do you think about that? Is that changing and what, what seems to work? Uh, well, I, we know that social media is uh, online. It's a digital uh, world we live in. Yes. Um, so we use uh, you know different social media platforms um, yes. to to create awareness, to educate uh, a lot of the awareness stuff. Um, content is educating about the prevalence, about the impact, about the you know how, what people can do to to you know make an impact. Yes. Um, but then also enabling individuals to be ambassadors, um, yeah, having yeah. them be educating, not being afraid to talk about brain injury, right. not being yeah. afraid to share what brain injury is and what the impact is. Yes. Um, and then the research community, educating on you know the findings, making sure that knowledge is translated or research is translated into practice. Um, so this education awareness is, is, is huge, but there's many different ways to to right, to exactly. Do. So as you say with research, it's important to take this research, empirical research, you know, based on evidence, and then turning it into something that's readable, usable, user-friendly for people so they can understand it and then take advantage of it that way. Sure. Okay. And, and making sure that research is put into practice. The right, millions of right. dollars that's spent on research is only, you know, is effective if it's put into practice. Right. So that knowledge translation, that knowledge mobilization um, is a key and making sure that the research community 
community is collaborating together so there's no duplications. Um, and, and then collaborating with the community associations, with the medical community, right. uh, to make sure that we're creating a network and a web uh, of yes. information and education for that's bettering the lives of these Absolutely. individuals and families. It's really, really targeted and focused so you're not, to use a cliche, reinventing the wheel, for example, Absolutely. making it more efficient. Uh, that's so, so important, mm -hmm. for, absolutely for sure. You mentioned earlier about methods of education and awareness, and you mentioned technology, which is huge nowadays, and uh, we're just entering a whole new era. In my generation, it was uh, a typewriter in high school, okay? And uh, even then, nowadays, it's difficult to be able to grasp the changes that happen, but certainly for reaching younger people, uh, I'm sure that's a, a, major, mm -hmm. a major thrust for you. Yeah, and but we also have to be mindful that um, Individuals with brain injury have sensory issues. They may have vision um, or their, you know, cognitive fatigue. So staring at a computer is not always, is not always applicable to them. Yeah, so yeah. creating content that is in smaller chunks or building in breaks or working on online accessibility. So creating, making sure that yeah, the content yeah. you put has the right contrast or that it's made in an accessible manner for of them. Course, of course. Um, so it, it's. There's all of these factors that need to be incorporated into how we deliver information. Right. And yeah. we don't want to just be the ones that are doing it. We want to make sure that everyone's doing it. So right. being the pioneer, right. but then also leading an example so that everyone's in, ensuring that everyone's including accessibility in their online information. Right, that's beautiful. And you know, implying that maybe uh, sensitivity to light or whatever, watching screens, very important, uh, would be a barrier. Are there other barriers that you can think of that need to be addressed, okay, in making education and awareness more accessible to, to uh, people living with a brain injury or families, caregivers, sure. whatever? Uh, well, plain language. Um, oh. uh, often the, we overestimate how much acronym, how many acronyms and how much jargon we, we use in everyday language. So creating oh. content in plain language. Um, yes. But then also education can be expensive. Education, sure. Um, sure. so, you know, creating um, content that is available in, you know, in, for free or publicly funded. Yes. Um, but looking at what are the needs and, the, and and seeking feedback from that population on how they want education. Yes, um, yes. It's, they need to be engaged in every aspect of the conversation. Of course. Um, they're the ones living, they're the ones with person, you know, with the lived experience. Right. So engage them in how how do they want to learn, how, uh, what information are they looking yes, for, yes. And, and how do they want that information presented. I'm wondering, Michelle, in terms of, of ways of reaching people and in terms of the human contact, if you're on a, a computer, that's fine, information is given there, but education is more than just facts or, or knowledge, it's about experience. So in terms of, let's say, uh, speaking to groups or whatever, mm -hmm. or, or hearing stories about people who are living with brain injuries, how powerful is that? Oh, hugely power. at our con uh, powerful. At our conference every year, yeah. the best part, when, when we look at the evaluation forms, yeah. the best part, are the, or the highest, highly rated, are the ones where it's those individuals with the lived experience that are talking um, from the gut, they're giving their real experience, and yes. that's what we need to ensure that we're, you know, that we're we keep on instilling in our professional population that these are real people with real experiences, Absolutely. and that needs to be conveyed often. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And 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 when you look at the, you know, that person-to-person -person contact is important. That yes. peer support. That um, we have a very large country yeah, uh, yeah. with a very rural, you know, small population compared to the size of our country. Right. So there is. A huge um, regional regional disparity in access to services so we need to make sure that people no matter where they live have access to those connections with digital our digital world makes that a little bit easier so if yes. it's a you know a online chat or if it's a telephone peer-to-peer um, -peer group that's really effective uh, but we can never diminish how important human connection is yes. um, and, and that sharing of experiences and sharing of challenges and sharing, sharing of successes right. is, to, is, is to everyone. Right, of course, when you're sitting, watching, or listening to somebody's story, it's very inspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, you see how they're coping and succeeding. It's offering hope as you watch their resilience. So that is powerful in and of itself. Right, right. And for service providers and clinicians, it, it it, it gives that, this is why we're doing it. Yes. To see those successes, to people come and meet their goals, whatever their goal may be. Um, yeah. Yeah. That is hugely impactful and 
and, and this is the whole reason why they're in this field is to make people meet their goals to make right. people thrive yes. um, and, uh, and and so sh making sure that those voices are heard and those stories are shared is really important right. and again we know that brain injuries encompass a whole range of things we may know most about concussions but that's only one area there's right. a whole bunch uh, of different possibilities that way and so when you're listening to somebody talk about brain injuries that person is not a brain injury that person is a human being and they happen to be uh, afflicted with or suffering a brain right. injury that they're coping with so to avoid labeling I think would be very important yeah and that's what we we the the person with lived experience this is their experience this is um, how their challenges their successes um, so that uh, they're the ones we need to be listening to. They're the ones we need to be taking our cues from. Yes. Um, and they're the ones that we need to be making sure that are you know feeling supported and engaged. Right. Um, because ultimately, they're the ones that are living right, with right. the brain injury. Conversation and dialogue is a two-way street. So you want to listen to people you know, who are living with brain injuries, but also family members and caregivers. How does it work with Brain Injury Canada in terms of that that flow of dialogue so you learn from them as well and can incorporate any suggestions? Uh, well, we work, we have our conference, which we yeah, try to yeah. make sure that it meets the variety of needs. Um, but then we also work with the community and, uh, uh, and provincial brain injury associations who really do the frontline work. They have the peer support groups, they yes. have the, um, the, the recreational activity, the social activity. So we work to make sure that anyone that calls in to Brain Injury Canada or emails in is connected with their local association. Right. Um, so uh, we want, our goal is to make sure that everyone has the education right. um, and the info to be able to find the services they need. Yep. Um, yep. But ultimately we want people to be able to thrive in their communities. Right. So directing people to those, community, those supports in their community is key. Right. Now again, with brain injuries, there are different kinds and different levels of severity, from mild to moderate, you know, to severe. In terms of linking people up to services, are there different services to meet different uh, levels of uh, of distress or, or well, absolutely, and, and and the needs are so varied that yeah. um, you know a support group. Uh, for everyone living with brain injury, when the only thing they have in common is their brain injury, probably isn't effective. So a brain injury for young adults, where yes. their context is similar, their perspective is similar. Right. It can't be just, the only commonality can't be just their brain injury. Uh, right. Brain injury support groups for uh, for yeah. women, they have a, there's a different, you know, there's a different uh, brain injury support groups for men. Yes. Their perspectives are unique. Um, and so creating programming and creating services that take this into account is really right. uh, key. It's not a one size fits all. Right. Um, really so, you know, looking at what the experience is and gaining their input into how these programs and services right. um, is, 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 is crucial because it's ultimately yeah. who it's for. Of course. It's, it's really tailor made, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of trying to link up people with the group that's, the group that's right, right and uh, the resource that's correct for them. As you say, one size doesn't fit all. But of course, people have different uh, different uh, motivations, different needs mm -hmm. uh, along the way. Men, women, younger people, older people. Um, what about addressing it in terms of multicultural issues right now? Because different, uh, we're a multicultural country. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. How do how do we deal with this? We need to be better. We need to be yeah, better yeah, about yeah. creating um, you know resources in multiple languages. Yes. Um, we need to be better about creating services in multiple languages. Right. Um, we have. Uh, we need to be taking into consideration our First Nations uh, mm -hmm. and, and their perspective and um, that ha hasn't been done but it, I'm seeing more of a shift towards that. Um, so creating content and creating resources for these unique populations right. is really important um, but it's, 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 it hasn't been done but it's, it's, it's coming. It's on the agenda and it yeah. needs to be done and of course each community would be uh, would need different things, right? right? And so you take about, not to get into it too much, but with the Indigenous community, uh, a very different way of approaching uh, the world in a, in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. And so you need to make sure the programs are, are meeting, you know, their worldview, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and with limited, many of the brain injury associations are relying on their own fundraising. Um, very few are publicly funded. Yeah. Um, so what resources are, and capacity are limited. Some yeah, of them yeah. are run by completely by, by volunteers. Right. Um, so 
allocating more resources, creating awareness will help to bring the resources to be able to cater to these, to create content and create right. experiences for these unique populations. Of course, and it takes money, of course, and you've been wonderfully successful recently with a government grant, but also you take individual donations. So um, tell us about your fundraising capacity because public relations and uh, fundraising and awareness are part of a package. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we need to create more of a momentum in the individual donors. Um, we need to, you know, have people support this, you know, support this industry, support these individuals. Yes. Um, you know, most of uh, all of the, you know, most of the, all the fi the finances that are raised by the community associations go into the programming. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, some of them are completely community run or volunteer oh, run. Wow. Um, so. Um, but then also government support, we need more public support and we more, need more um, corporate support. We need, right. um, with, and, and some of it needs to be goodwill. It's, uh, yeah. It just needs to be, this is a huge segment of our population that needs services. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and the impact of brain injury to mental health, to homelessness, to unemployment, Absolutely. to substance abuse. Um, brain injury can be the root cause of all of those. Yes. Um, so yes. that needs to be taken into consideration and funding needs to come from a variety of different sources right. to really boost these associations to be able to do what they need to do to support their communities. No, you, you put out an aspirational plan of what needs to be done that way, but when you talk about corporate support or foundation support, but we'll stick with corporate support, it is so important that way. And in big corporations, you, based on statistics, you know there are people in these corporations suffering and often in silence and uh, could certainly be helped, you know, by yeah. the corporation being involved, finding it easier for them than to talk about it publicly. And right. Well, and you'd be it. hard pressed to find any person that has not been impacted by acquired brain injury in any way, whether it be a concussion, whether it be a more moderate to severe traumatic injury, or stroke, or yes. you know, um, anoxic or hypoxic brain injury. Right. You'd be very hard pressed to find anyone that has not been touched by brain injury in some way. Right. So everyone should be tied to supporting these individuals and families. It makes sense. And a big piece of this we haven't really focused on too much is prevention. We've talked about, in, you know, over the time we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, resources that may be out there and, and what you might do. But what about prevention to, to reduce the likelihood of these occurring at all? Sure. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the common is the helmets. Um, but helmets prevent more serious brain injuries, but they don't prevent concussions. But still, in, in ingraining in everyone that a helmet should be part of every bicycle, yep. um, skateboard, scooter, um, skiing, um, yes. ATV, so, I mean, the, the list is endless. Right. Um, right. But then also educating yourself, while not every brain injury can't be prevented, we have car accidents, falls, yeah. knowing what the symptoms are so you can mitigate more complex symptoms or more lingering symptoms. But right. for some people, that's it's just not... It, no matter how, what, with treatment, they'll still have persistent symptoms. Um, yes. So making sure that they're supported. Um, right. But prevention is absolutely key, but unfortunately not all brain injuries can be prevented. Well, of course, that's simply a reality, but even a little bit of knowledge or information may make a difference in saving somebody's life, God forbid, or uh, stopping the possibility of having uh, a concussion absolutely. or a more serious brain injury. So that's part of the mandate of, of Brain Injury Canada. Yeah, absolutely. On this. Um, Michelle, education is so fundamental to raising awareness about brain injuries and there are so many different groups out there that really can benefit from raised awareness and education. So what are some of those groups and how can they actually benefit from education? Yeah, well first and foremost are the ind individuals themselves. Uh, they can become their own health advocates, learning what's happening, learning about new treatment options. Um, and, and we know that stimulation creates a healthy brain um, it, for mental wellness, mental well-being, as also engagement in their community and their society. Um, so education is really important for the survivors themselves. But right. then also family members. Family yeah. members we know yeah. are hugely impacted. So educating themselves on things from what cre tax credits are available to them. Uh, yeah. What, what yeah. ways can they take care of themselves? Uh, what services and resources are available to them? And how can they not only take care of themselves, but take care of their loved one if they're in that caregiver position. Right, to avoid burnout and stress, how to deal with that. So uh, it's uh, areas like finances and legal issues that people 
probably I didn't think about that. Yeah. So uh, thanks for raising that. No problem. And one of the big areas for uh, for education is professionals. Professionals should always be learning, educating themselves on new clinical guidelines. I mentioned before the Ontario Neurotrauma Guidelines. Yes, uh, I hear yes. too often of physicians giving out the wrong information. So continually learning, continually bettering your practice. Um, and then also educating the educators. Children are going to school, they're in school, they're not being specifically educated according to their brain injury, taking in those sensory impairments that are now part of their lives. A lot of uh, teachers are not armed with that knowledge, so creating vehicles to educate the educators better, yes, the, yes. create successful education plans for those children, and then they can thrive and continue on. Right. Can I throw in coaches, athletic coaches, for example, because kids are playing football and hockey and, and wrestling and other things of that nature that may give rise to a, a brain injury of some kind. Uh, what about educating them? Absolutely. Parachute.org uh, has great information wow. um, geared to both professionals, um, coaches, parents, um, to talk about the return to learn and return to play guidelines and what to, when to pull a, uh, an athlete from, um, from activity. Um, so there is that education happening. We just need to make sure that people are actually utilizing it yes. um, and learning from it and building on it. One of the things, Michelle, about, about raising awareness, and I'll have to address this openly and directly, is stigma okay, mm -hmm. around this. Can you tell us about, you're making progress, by the way, in diminishing stigma. Can you tell us about that and how it impacts people's perceptions? Well, absolutely. There's a lot of um, judgment and marginalization for those living with acquired brain injury. Uh, there's a lot that live below the poverty line, at or below the poverty line. Um, so creating opportunities um, for employment. A lot of people with brain injury are either underemployed or unemployed. So creating yes, opportunities yes. for them to be engaged. And, and through engagement and understanding and education and awareness, that's right. how we end stigma. Uh, yes. we, we Instilling empathy in people and understanding um, of the experience of that other person is a really a good vehicle to, to end stigma. Um, so that's what we're working towards and that's what we work with our community partners um, right. and that's the whole point of June as Brain Injury Awareness Month yes. is to educate the, the general public about what is involved with brain injury, how, what right. is, you know, as I mentioned before, how it impacts people, what are the barriers they experience yes. and then how can we support as a society and as a community, how can we better support these Absolutely. people? Absolutely, inclusively bringing people into the process that way. We need to make our world accessible and inclusive. Yes. And we're yes. coming, but we're not there yet. It's, it's a work in progress, but you're making Absolutely. great strides in that. What's happening during June for Awareness Month across the country with BIC? Uh, well, across the country, uh, brain injury associations at the provincial and local level are doing lots of activities. There's fundraising activities, there's awareness activities. Um, so anyone can go to our website, www.braininjurycanada.ca, to see the listing of associations across Canada. Um, on June 6th, there's a National Day of Collaboration where everyone's encouraged to go to their Member of Parliament, their MLA, their Member of the Legislative Assembly, yes. to, to raise awareness um, to our policymakers, uh, to our government officials of how pre prevalent and pervasive brain injury is right. and really put it on their radar. Of course. Um, yeah. And what with Brain Injury Canada, we, we're doing an online campaign um, yeah. to focus on different topic areas, prevalence, impact. Um, in engagement and then also change. Yes. You know, what can we, what can every person, how can they cont contribute to change right. within the brain injury world? Because education leads to change. It leads yeah, absolutely. to action. It's the, absolutely. First, the first step. And right? it's empowering. Sure. Education, knowing absolutely. the real facts, it's empowering for everyone. It's so true. And in terms of dealing with, with politicians and bureaucrats, for example, raising awareness, I don't think we can ever overestimate, if I can honestly say it, the, uh, the amount of knowledge they have. And so they need to have this knowledge. And then the economic costs of brain injuries. Any, any stats or any sense about, about, uh, about that? The, uh, the, the economic cost on the public system is huge. Um, and the insurance system keeps on scaling back coverage for, for individuals. Yes. Um, and then they're relying on the public system. But the, right. big, the big impact is in indirect costs. So those costs to the families that are now paying out of pocket or having to make adjustments to their home yes. or paying for treatments um, or are, have lost their job because their caregiver role has become too 
too all-encompassing that they can yes. no longer work. So we need to look at the the public cost, the indirect cost, um, but it's it, it's it's massive. It's it's in the the tens of billions. It's, the indirect cost. It's phenomenal. So it has to be addressed, you know, for for many many reasons on that. Now, certainly you instill hope, you know, through Brain Injury Canada and a lot of positive things are happening. You mentioned about helping people become more resilient. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that. Do you have a story or a vignette of an example of somebody who has worked with you or through your efforts has really made uh, some tremendous progress? It's so inspirational. Uh, well, I have hundreds and thousands. I've been yeah, working yeah. in this field for the, 10 years yeah, and I, yeah. you know, I, every person I meet has their own unique story and their own unique resilient story because they're moving forward. They're still fighting, they're still recovering. Um, so I, I, there's no one person right. that I want to highlight because I want to highlight all of them. That there right. is this incredible spirit, this incredible resilience in this group of people, families, individuals, um, service providers that work in this field. Yes. Um, so every story as, is as important as the next and yeah. every story is as inspiring as the next. Right. So as you said earlier on, brain injuries isn't about can't, it's about can. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and again, offering that hope and recognizing that supports are out there, that indeed uh, people can have positive lives and make great contributions, having had a, a brain injury that way. So for Brain Injury Canada, what lies ahead? Well, we've got a lot of exciting yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, one of the yeah. biggest um, is that we've received a three-year grant um, from the government of Canada to develop a comprehensive online resource. Tell us about that, what that will be. So when people look for information, access to information is a challenge. And so when we tell people to educate themselves, when they go to Google um, to access information, how do they decipher what's credible, what's evidence-based yes. versus what's marketing, what's trying to sell something. And so we are creating an online resource um, and consolidating all of that information from all this, we've got all this wonderful studies and guidelines and research um, happening across Canada and the world, but it's all sitting in silos on different websites yeah, yeah. and challenging to, right. to find. So if yeah, we can consolidate yeah. that all into one website geared to the user geared to those with brain injury, those family members, and then also service providers that want to educate themselves. Yeah, so yeah. it's a huge multi-phase project. It'll include a service directory, it'll include online courses, um, but we're really hoping that this will act as the bridge to connect the brain injury community, yes. but then also do it in the Canadian context. We want the Canadian perspective right. for those Canadians that are living with brain injury yeah. and for anyone to access information, reliable information at any right. time, 24 hours a day. Excellent. And you talked about working in partnerships, that being so important, collaboration. Can you tell us more about that? Well, our partners on this project are, are we've got the Canadian Traumatic Brain Injury Resource uh, Research Consortium, yeah. we have the CNIB, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, yeah. the Canadian yeah. Association for the Deaf, the Canadian Association for the Hard of Hearing. Yes. Uh, we've got extensive partnerships on this project, but then we're also looking to add to that partnership, yes. add to, you know, get the universities, those knowledge centers involved. Yes. Um, and have this t this be a tool for everyone. Have everyone engaged, um, and in, in this tool, yes. this education and awareness tool. Um, so we we're, this this will be an evolving project. Right. It will be a living being. Yes. Um, but it's something that we're really excited and we're, and and it's been a, a huge gap in in the Canadian landscape and, and frankly the world. There's no website like this or no site like this. Um, for brain injury, so we're really hoping to, you know, create a, um, a a vehicle for everyone to get behind. Right, that's that's wonderful. You really are being a pioneer in this, and really setting the template for uh, global uh, awareness and yeah, education absolutely. and collaboration. Yeah, and is, one of the key points of this yeah. that I forgot to mention was the accessible accessibility. Online uh, online accessibility is is it's becoming more of a focus. Yeah, so yeah. Um, looking at, you know, how do people, who, who's coming to our site and what yeah, are yeah. there, what, what can be the barriers that a website could, um, and, uh, could pose. Right. Um, so building that accessibility, that universal design into the foundation of the, the site from the start right. um, is a key part of this project. Right, that's, that's excellent. And, and you know, it's called Brain Injuries, the Silent Epidemic, mm -hmm. okay? Can you just uh, tell us why that is? 
Well, I think it's the invisible nature of brain injury. It's um, and the no person. Some I think I mentioned before that someone may look completely yeah, yeah. normal on the outside, but on the inside are dealing with a whole host of impairments. Yes. Um, so the the invisible nature and the that and that. There's not a huge, there's not a, a national movement. There's not a national strategy right now. In for, Canada, there's no government national strategy. For brain injury, there is not. Um, so this is, we won't be silent for much longer. Um, and uh, we, it, and there's, there's a huge passion and there's, um, there's a huge motivation within the brain injury community from survivors to to you know community sectors to the clinicians yes um, so we will make sure it's heard w wonderful and just it's really been a fascinating interview and it's been educational for me and for other people who are watching here if there were some takeaways you'd like people to uh, think about after they watch this interview what would they be well I think the key thing is we can do better we're we can do better as a community to make sure these individuals and families are supported, valued, and engaged. Yes. Um, we also need to look at the person, not just now, but look over the lifespan. Look at and create plans and create supports that evolve with them as they change. Um, and, and just be more empathetic as a community. Be more, become educated on what these challenges are for those living because this is a huge segment of our population yes um so i think you know education awareness um and then advocating advocating for the needs advocating becoming not just one voice but the the millions of voices for those um but making sure that those voices are heard so that change does happen wonderful now brain injury canada is an organization on the move there's no question about that so uh, how can people help you donate to you volunteer with you how can people uh, take advantage of what's out there? Well, that's a good question, and we welcome uh, we welcome all of that. Um, they can visit our website uh -huh. uh, www.braininjurycanada.ca. Um, they can they can also email us at info at braininjurycanada.ca. Um, but also get involved in their local associations. We work with many of our partners across Canada. So if you live in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, get involved in your local association. If you live in Charlottetown, PEI, okay. connect, see how you can volunteer, see how you can support that, yes. that community um, okay. and all of their efforts. There's brain injury associations across Canada that are always looking for volunteers and always okay. looking for new members. Um, right. And for those individuals who are living with brain injury that are feeling isolated yes. and alone, contact your local brain injury association. Okay. There's peer support groups, there's online peer support groups, phone groups, right. um, but no one should feel isolated. Um, and so we just need to create a better way for people to be engaged. And that's part of the, the one of the, the reasons for this website right. is that anyone, no matter where you live in Canada, yes. will be able to access information Right. Um, and, and, and forms of support no matter where they live, no matter what time of day. Right, so stay tuned. And Michelle McDonald, you are an extremely passionate, <laughs> dedicated, informed uh, ambassador and leader for this movement. So thank you for taking the time today to educate us about brain injuries, their importance, and what needs to be done. So best of luck. Well, we thank you for all your support and all you do for the nonprofit and community. It's, oh, it's, it's incredible. It's and you're a leader, an exemplary. Well, my, my pleasure. Working with you as patron of Brain Injury Canada is uh, a great privilege. All right. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you.